We formed the Cannery Row Foundation in this room in 1983, and our effort then has been singular ever since. We're here to share the lab and the information that we know about, about uh, Cannery Row, about Steinbeck. John Steinbeck was writing about real people and real places. So the, the takeaway is that he didn't write much fiction. He wrote about real people and real places. So that's been a pleasure and an accomplishment for all of us to help find it. One of the people that helped do that uh, in our era was uh, Kalisa Moore. Her statue was across the street. Uh, so we're celebrating Kalisa's birthday today, and we do it like we've done for almost 20 years now. And she happened to rent in 1959, 57, she leased a little place down here she, across from the aquarium she thought was a, a rooming house. Well, it turns out to be the La Ida Cafe in Steinbeck's Cannery Row, the two of the three major whorehouses that he actually used in the book, uh, where Eddie, the part-time bartender, would pour all the leftover drinks from the night's business into the same jug for Mac and the boys back at the palace. So Mac and the boys, Actually, they were they were real people. They're the basic theme of Cannery Row is a birthday party. Essentially, these guys are throwing for Ed Ricketts, who's just such a great guy. And the Palace Flop House was right up the hill here. That's another real place. You go right up the steps here, across the uh, to the what is now the the uh, recreational trail was the rail line. Up the next set of steps to the vacant lot to your left was the actual site of the Palace Flop House. It was a triplex for Cannery workers. John describes it as a fish meal barn. So he does get to play with things like the name of the whorehouse right across the street. It was really called the Lone Star. And so John takes the Lone Star, the Texas flag, and he turns it into the Bear Flag restaurant, the California state flag in the book. So he, he had a ball with this book that he wrote almost entirely from memory in New York in 1944. And he came here, uh, had finished it, did the Pearl here in an Adobe in Monterey, and then went to Mexico to make the film and never came back. This, this same street that seems so calm and quiet right now would scream and rumble and shake, um, and, a, and a river of sardines would come from the bay here. On an average, about 200,000 tons a season were landed here in six months. That's about a billion sardines. Basically fish from almost Santa Barbara all the way up to the Farallons when the boats got bigger. And then the right sandwich between a couple of these sardine factories was Edricus Lab. The question is, John Steinbeck probably was thinking, or knew, he, of course he knew this lab, but he was probably thinking of the older lab, which had slight different changes in what can we grow. So welcome to Ed Ricketts Lab. The original building was stucco, and it was a one-floor cottage. And um, he, bought, he bought the property in 1928, beginning in 1929, because of the concrete tanks out back. The Spanish family that had this house had been trying to salt fish. Um, it was perfect for moving his lab from Pacific Road to Cannery Road in 1929. He had the old uh, cottage lifted and a, uh, a PG contractor built the, uh, the basement under it, set the house back down on it. And that was the way John Steinbeck first ran into Ed Ricketts. That was the original lab that John Steinbeck knew so well. So one of the questions we have, it's theoretical of course, when he wrote Cannery Row from, largely from memory in 1944 in New York, was he thinking of this lab? This is the second lab, so right off the bat, you folks know some things that a lot of locals don't know, and a lot of uh, academics, that this is actually the second iteration of Ed Ricketts' lab here on Cannery Row. It was in this lab that uh, he lived and worked in the 1930s and 1940s when he turned marine biology upside down. He literally uh, helped revolutionize the approach to marine biology exhibited by the entire presentation and theoretical orientation of marine biology expressed by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It was the importance of the association of living organisms, not just one from here and one from there and one from there the way I used to see it at the, at the Steinhardt Aquarium up in San Francisco as a kid. But uh, he was interested in the interconnectedness of things in the tide pool. He never was a diver, never had his head wet, he was always in his waders, but he was looking into the tide pools at these aggregations of animals. And we didn't have a word for it at the time, but it's called ecology. The interrelationship of these little things. And he was not a, uh, particularly well liked at the Hopkins Marine Station. 
Stanford's uh, research facility because he didn't have a degree. And uh, originally they also kind of felt he was a poacher. He was taking things out of the marine environment and out of the, the of course he was selling in the schools and laboratories and, and hospitals and training schools, all kinds of things. How many folks uh, had opened a frog or something like that as a kid in, in biology class? They may have come from Pacific Biological Laboratories right here in Norway. I'd like to, uh, ah, Frank Wright. <laughs> I would like to ask Frank to tell one short story about how he met Ed Ricketts up at the Presidio. But Frank is one of two of the gentlemen that owned this lab since 1958 uh, that actually knew Ed Ricketts. And although it's called the lab group, both he and Drew Bruce Harris were the only two that actually had the pleasure and the honor of knowing Ed. Well, anyway, it's nice to see everyone. And uh, I first uh, met Ed in the Army. Ed's uh, dis dispensary was in the next building to where my section was. We were called classification and assignment, CNA. And we interviewed uh, inductees and assigned them a, a category and reported that to Fort Douglas. Our headquarters that we reported to was in Utah. Well, anyway, Ed and I got uh, to know each other because we had a mutual friend. Well, I didn't know who Ed was, but he explained that he was a marine biologist and that he was a corporal in the dispensary and that uh, he lived on Canary Road. Boyd and I walked down and, and knocked at the door and we were welcomed in by Ed and uh, everything was Really wonderful. I hadn't didn't real I hadn't realized that he was one of the men that uh, was giving shots and doing lab work. That was my first breaking of army regulations, off the post without a pass. Um, Boyd and I were realized that Ed didn't have a supply of beer or potato chips, so we went over to Wing Chong's Market, and there was a tiny little Chinese guy who was uh, manning the store and he looked just like Wing Chong, just like uh, Steinbeck had described him, with eyes that looked like burning embers. And when you walked in the door, he was watching every move you made, <laughs> afraid you were going to steal something. So we bought a, we bought a couple of double-sized bottles of Burgermeister beer. Uh, that uh, they were 35 cents and a bag of chips 10 cents so we listened to music all classical music he didn't like jazz a fun evening but that's how we met and uh, became friends and, and the ensuing two years we spent a lot of time coming down here and we got to be such good friends that uh, on a three-day pass I stayed here Steinbeck stayed there for weeks at a time when he was in town. And I slept there when I had a three-day pass. And when Ed Ricketts Jr. was in town, he uh, stayed there. Now, you'd think that the sheets might have been changed in between times. But to the best of my knowledge, they never were. <laughs> we're sort of a customer of the road.